It is Monday, November 18th, 2019. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and so you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. It was a very tiring, get your ass kicked at Jiu Jitsu Monday. Oh my goodness. Man, I got my ass kicked. I kicked a little bit of ass, but mostly I was getting my ass kicked. You know, it's like a, no matter what I do, Monday feels like a, like a complete restart on, on my, my uh, jiu-jitsu journey. I, I don't understand it, really. Um, it doesn't matter if I do, like, the, the Monday early a.m. class or the p.m. class. I always feel like I'm starting all over again. And uh, today it was, uh, I, I think it was because today's class, the, the Monday class, is a, a jiu-jitsu too. And so, I mean, it, it's just, it's not something I'm normally doing. I'm like, I'm, you know, if, if I do get in on it, it's because I missed out on jiu-jitsu in the morning. Which, of course, was what happened today. I lost the battle with the, uh, the old uh, alarm clock. It won. I, when I finally woke up to turn it off, it was about 6:30. I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna drive all the way into fucking town, get there at seven, work out until 7:30, and then drive home. I'm just not gonna do it. I mean, as much as I dig working with the guy that's there in the morning, I'm not gonna do that. <clears throat> it's just too far. And then, and then go back there in the evening for for a full class. No, I'm not gonna do it. So I just decided, screw it. I'm gonna go for the class today and uh yeah it was good it was good it was really good i uh, pulled some neat tricks even though i was gassed out about halfway through the class i mean e- even though we weren't supposed to be moving you know to that the um the warm-ups themselves are a little more intense for um for jujitsu too as they should be you know as they should be and it's something that for some stupid reason i keep forgetting that that's jujitsu too and it's like you know i get my ass completely kicked there and i'm like what the fuck is going on here oh right yeah there's no white belts in this class <laughs> you know it's like i i understand now yeah that, that, there's a distinct difference in caliber of the person i'm rolling with and it's it's not just that but like i said the the pace and intensity of the class is a little bit higher and and so uh in yeah anyway we did a lot of sparring today i mean a lot of sparring and i pulled some interesting tricks and there was one in particular where i was in a um kind of a turtle position and my opponent was trying to assume the back and i had brought my my right foot up you know to where I, I was had my right foot flat and what I did was I reached down and I grabbed his his um, his his uh, calf and I pulled his calf in toward me while I I pushed on him with my shoulder and this is while I was like really really tired and, and it, it just it worked out to the point where I was on my way to getting on to a full mount I was definitely on on uh, side control from there but um, the point being that, like I said, I pulled some really neat tricks today. And um, we did this one training that I, I really found useful. And that was that we were we were sparring but no grips. We couldn't grip onto the gi or anything like that. And I gripped on my own hands one uh, like twice. But I was trying to be really conscientious about gripping onto my opponent, which was the prohibition that the the instructor had set for us is don't grip your your opponent and my opponent gripped me once but he he remembered really quick and let go but anyway um there were some interesting moves i did with him where i i managed to sweep him with a straight arm instead of uh instead of having the uh you know some sort of grip on him uh, it's it's amazing how how much contact i was able to keep and and even retain like closeness and whatnot, um, just with keeping my arms straight. You know, I, I ran in an underhook, and it, it allowed me to continue on into a nice sweep. And I, I again, I wish I was recording it because that that that's something that'll probably come up a million times during sparring, and I could really use it. 
Um, but I did manage to do an interesting setup. You know, we, my, um, my early morning teammate and I were working some. Uh, it's like a 180 arm bar, you know, an entry for a 180 arm bar. And so when we were doing um, flow rolling, that was one that it seemed really, really natural to me. And I had to go about it the um, a special way. <laughs> and I say special because when we were training it, um, we we didn't do it in this one particular way that I, I did it this time. Is There's a point where you go from side control and you're working up to getting your your right say your right hip right up to the armpit right armpit of your opponent and getting that arm like getting a um your left hand under their their right tricep and holding that arm right well i found a really interesting trick to do is after you've got that for this particular setup for the 180 arm bar i found what i like to do is i like to take that arm and push it down and get my leg over it. Okay, get my left leg over it. That way when I come up on, on top, the arm is between my legs. I mean I could I could set up for, for an Americana right there. You know, I've got the I've got pretty much the the right setup for, for a Kimura right or a Kimura or an, or an Americana right there. You know, I mean all I would really have to do is staple down the right arm with my right leg and that would be that but this is a setup for a 180 arm bar and so from there what you want to do is get like an underhanded grip on their left hand on their um, their uh, left tricep and just a little bit above the elbow and then you want to like tuck it really really hard down you know and then you step over the head and you swing it around and get that arm bar but anyway I found myself setting that up quite a bit today and so I, I think the um, the work that we put in the other day in the morning really really paid off because like I said I it, it was really easy for me you know it's like if I could get that hip down if I could get that hip down on side control I grabbed the tricep just like reflexively pulled it up stuck the goddamn right knee under the under his shoulder and then pushed the arm back down and started going for it. And I think that there's a point or two in there that I can get it even tighter than I have been. And as a matter of fact, there was an there was an adaptation that we did on that one that that made it even tighter. And it was, I think you you want to have like a um, you want to have right knee on belly, the um, the right hand hooking around the the uh, the upper arm. At, like at, at the tricep just above the elbow and pulling it down and then reaching past your opponent to the ground you know like reaching forward into the ground while you're pulling that to you and taking your knee and 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 for your um your left leg and pushing it on, over your um over your opponent's chest and shooting it right over their their uh, left shoulder and hooking it with that foot and that's your your pivot point to spin you know on that on that uh on that uh arm bar and i found i i i wasn't able to pull it off like that yet i haven't been able to pull pull it off like that yet but the person that i was working with i felt like when he did it that way there was no point where the pressure was off of me you know, and especially if he's if he's windshield wiping that that right leg back and I mean that right arm, and stapling that right arm down and adjusting the pressure as he needs to. I mean, like I said, he did it one time where he just he shot that knee clean over my shoulder, and hooked my my neck with his his ankle and then spun on it. And like I said, I did not feel a, a loose point in there where you know I could jank you out of it or something like that. He had me locked in tight, and this is a guy that that I outweigh by, I would say fifty, maybe sixty pounds. And like I said, he he was putting so much pressure on me, and, and a couple counter pressures, you know, like that where I couldn't roll left or roll right or pull an arm out or anything because he had me pretty locked up. So 
this is a uh, this is something I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to work a little bit on today. I mean, not not today, but you know, later on, because I I feel like that's a a really solid way to pass over that is to to get that shin right up on the shoulder and hooking that hooking the neck around with the the ankle there and then spinning on it, you know, and swinging those hips under the under the shoulder, bring the leg up, lock it in. That's what we like. Anyway, let's go ahead and throw down with some music. And it's got to be body count, because you know, that's how we open it up. And, uh, hmm. But what song? <sighs> well, I played 99 Problems. That was pretty funny. Um... I'm just gonna go straight straight back to the old uh, bloodlust, and uh, yeah, that's a good song. Bloodlust, first dance, here on Coin Metal. And that was Mastodon with "Crack the Sky." <clears throat> Sorry about that. I had to get a little hydration going on there. I have to turn this down just a teeny tiny. There we go. There we go. All right. So as far as what we're going to get into today, um, I got a few things. Honestly, I just caught this one. It's it's um, it was something that uh, Soon Rocket posted, and I, I thought this is kind of pretty cool. Um, but anyway, those of you who have been around long enough might recognize this name. Anyway, this is on uh, finance.yahoo.com. U.S. President's brother was paid $300,000 by missing crypto queen Ponzi scammer. And this is by Darren Parkin. It was uh, coin, I guess it was originally published on CoinRivet on November 17th, 2019. So apparently this person is a time traveler. We like that. Oh no, this is yesterday. No, oh, sorry. Continuing on. The brother of former U.S. President George W. Bush has been sensationally implicated in the OneCoin scandal after court documents revealed that he had been paid $300,000 to attend a meeting with crypto queen Ruja Ignatova. Businessman Neil Bush met with the 38-year-old head of OneCoin in Hong Kong to outline a deal with the company he has Connect, he has been connected with Hoifu Energy and Ignavada's one coin. Why do I want to say Ignatava? Yeah, it's Ignatava. Yeah, there we go. Uh, one coin. The 64 year old Texan's involvement came to light during the testimony of former attorney Mark Scott, who is facing charges of fraud and money laundering as part of an ongoing one coin trial in New York. Businessman Neil Bush, son and brother of two world leaders, Scott claims he was an innocent party in the Ponzi scheme and could see nothing wrong with the workings of OneCoin. His lawyer, um, Arlo Devlin Brown, sought to legitimize Scott's, <coughs> Scott's naivete by citing the involvement of the son and brother of, of two former world leaders. Devlin Brown argued for a subpoena for Bush in order to testify for his client. Bush, an active investor, has been part of the board of Hoifu Energy, owned by Chinese billionaire Dr. Hoi Hu, Hu Ching Chi Ming. My apologies, sir. Thrashed out. Hoifu had been looking to seal a, a loan deal worth $60 million to be part funded by OneCoin. Details which were set to be thrashed out during the meeting between the three parties in Hong Kong for which Bush received $300,000. This claimed Devlin Brown to U.S. District Judge Edgardo Ramos was enough to give Mark Scott reassurance that OneCoin was perfectly credible was a perfectly credible finance company. Yeah, whatever. Judge Ramos invited Mark Scott's counsel, David Garvin, to speak after the confirming details of the meeting and payment. 
Garvin read excerpts from the transcript of an FBI interview with Neil Bush. It read, quote, Bush recalled that the head of Hoifu Energy, Dr. Hu Chi Ming, received a bunch of cryptocurrency for an oil deal in Madagascar. Bush had had a residual interest in the cryptocurrency from the oil deal. Bush met with the woman from the cryptocurrency company, Ruja Ignavada, in Hong Kong with Dr. Hu. Failed deal. Quoting some of the files, Garvin added that Hu had told Bush he would be entitled to 10% of the profits if Hu could secure a deal to sell the cryptocurrency. The files confirmed the deal failed to go ahead. Neil Bush's counsel, David Gerger, was then invited to take the stand. While acknowledging that his client was at the meeting, he denied Bush was a member of Hoifu's board of directors. He also made it quite clear that Neil Bush had no dealings whatsoever with Mark Scott. Quote, He did not exercise that option, and he did not invest, confirmed Gerger. After he attended one meeting, I think he asked a few more questions, and that was it. Following a brief deliberation, Judge Ramos ruled Neil Bush's testimony held no relevance to the case for the defense and therefore no subpoena would be required. Quote, the fact that it was a real transaction or not seems to me somewhat beside the point, Judge Ramos ruled, so I don't see how Mr. Bush can add to the relevant elements of Scott's defense and at the end of the day, I think that quash uh, that, that quashal is appropriate. The trial continues next week. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's very, very interesting here. Let me see what the reactions are here. It looks like there's a lot of them. <laughs> here we go. Um, GA says, Neil Bush also is this investigated in SNL. Mount, meltdown of the 80s. Silverado savings and loans in Colorado. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, Love Mex Food says, Wasn't Neil Bush a principal in the Silverado Savings and Loan Bank scandal a few years back? Some things never change. Uh, Susie Q says, I made two comments about how the Bush family was connected to the Saudi Arabia Royals, and Yahoo won't let me let it post. Oh, gosh, I wonder why. <laughs> Lunar. You knew it was Neil before you, you completely read the story. He is the son that was a head of a bank that went bankrupt that opened the, that opened the way for bank, for bank presidents to go to jail and banks to be bailed out by his daddy. Of course, Neil got off scot-free. Damn Skippy. Let's see here. Neil uh, Frontier says Neil has had previous legal problems, and he posted all this stuff about the savings and loan. Uh, and let's see what the quote is here: it's, uh, "Savings and loan or thrift is a financial institution that accepts savings deposits and makes mortgage, car, and other personal loans to individuals. The savings and loan or thrift is a financial institution that accepts deposits." Blah 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 blah. Okay. Oh, this is Silverado Savings and Loan. Let's read what it was, the, the whole thing here. Uh, Silverado Savings and Loan collapsed in 1988, costing taxpayers $1.3 billion. That was B with a billion. Billion with a B. The son of then Vice President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, was the board of directors of Silverado at the, at the time. Neil Bush was accused of giving himself a loan from Silverado, but he denied all all wrongdoing. The U.S. Office of Thrift Supervision investigated Silverado's failure and determined that Neil Bush had engaged in numerous <clears throat> breaches of fiduciary duties involving multiple conflicts of interest. Although Bush was not indicted on criminal charges, a civil action was brought against him and other Silverado directors by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and it was eventually settled out of court with Bush paying $50,000 as part of the settlement. <laughs> oh, God, that's funny. As a director of a failing thrift, 
Bush voted to approve $100 million that were ultimately bad loans to two of his business partners, and in voting for the loans, he failed to inform fellow board members at Silverado Savings and Loan that the loan applicants were his business partners. Um, Bush paid the $50,000 fine, paid for him by Republican supporters, and was banned from banking activities for his role in taking down Silverado, which cost taxpayers $1.3 billion. An RTC suit against Bush and other Silverado officers was settled in 1991 for $26.5 million. Yeah, in other words, jack shit. <sighs> You know, this this kind of stuff has been going on on both sides of the aisle. And that's the thing that, that bugs me the most about it is that, you know, people are kind of quick to call up on, um, on up when Republicans do this stuff. But what about when Democrats do it or Democrats do things similar, you know, that they're they're given positions of executive positions in multiple different places and then their own fraudulent activity causes the collapse you know and they they walk away rich you know i mean you, you know you look at congress uh, on both sides of the aisle you're talking about people that make i think it's like the the annual annual wages for it is like $175,000 a year but you look at these people you know, just their entire loan costs one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Just just washing their stuff costs one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year. I mean, they, they are they are dressed quite well. You know, they they are quite well kept, indicating that they're they're worth a hell of a lot more than one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a year. But uh, yeah, you know, again, they they get these these advisory roles in in. Um, in different companies, both while they're they're in office and afterward, of course. But you know, you, you look at um, this whole bullshit with uh, Trump, and it really is bullshit. I mean, if you if from what I've investigated out of it, what I got is this: that basically, when Obama was president, the the Ukrainian government had changed hands. And the new administration, or, or the old administration, I think it was the old administration, was investigating issues of corruption within the um, the uh, state-owned gas company, and or natural gas company. And what they found, or what the prosecutor found, was that um, <clears throat> Joe Biden's son was receiving, I think it was like five. Five hundred thousand dollars a month, or some, some outrageous amount of fucking money a month for this advisory role on a board, or he he was an employee on the board, or some shit like that, and he wasn't really doing anything, and so the prosecutor was investigating him, and Biden put the arm on him to to, or actually put the arm on the Ukrainian president, said, "Hey, yo, you you know all that aid we're sending you." Yeah, we're going to shut that off if you don't kill this investigation. And they they did. Actually, they fired the prosecutor. You know, so when we're talking about political influence and we're talking about who bribed who for what, we we got to roll it back all the way here. And from what I understand of the of the Trump thing is that he asked the president about that investigation said hey yo is there any meat on this bone is there anything we should know about this now whether or not it was implied that you know there's some reason that the the money that they're going to give them or whatever has been del being delayed you know contingent on the sensor i have no idea but i do know that if we want to talk about criminal activity and we want to talk about corruption you're talking about the wrong fucking thing if you're barking up Trump's tree. If he's guilty of something like like what Biden's kid was doing, then we need to fucking fire that shit up. We need to drag that into court because that's a that's an actual criminal activity. But you know this this whole trying to pick some sort of um, impeachment thing over is it's a bunch of fucking bullshit. It really is.
If you read all of the information, and I do mean all of the information that you can get a hold of on it, I haven't done all of the information, but from what I've investigated so far, that's what it appears to be. You know, so like I said, if there's if there's more to it, but what it what it reveals to me, what is more important that it reveals to me, is that we do have significant amounts of corruption. And it's done by the same way, where you have state-sponsored government co- companies employing either direct relatives or former people that, that were in charge here. You know, there, there were like congressmen, senators, mayors, governors that have significant con- political influence and connections. You know, and what's sad is what they do is this, that they set up an aid package for Ukraine, right? Then they send the aid to the Ukraine, and the Ukraine hires a bunch of people to to spend this money to do what, you know, the, the package was supposedly meant for. Only they, they don't limit the pool of people that they hire to Ukrainians. No, 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 no. They start looking to people like Neil Bush and Joe Biden's kid and say, hey, yo, we'll we'll give your kid a job, you know, if you uh, do this for us. And then then Biden's kid get $500,000 a month. And of course, some of that is going back to the old man. You know it, if not all of it or most of it. (laughs) But the point of the matter is, is that this has been going on for decades and there really should be something against it. Because in my mind, it allows for the possibility of undue influence from other governments on our government. And entangling alliances, which we're supposed to be staying out of. You know, I mean, And that's exactly why we, our forefathers prohibited such things. And as a matter of fact, I believe there was a... Either there was a proposal for a constitutional amendment, or or one time it was a constitutional amendment, and it just got forgotten about. I think it was, if it was, it was the thirteenth, or it was like the original eighth, or something like that. That there was an amendment, and I don't know if it was proposed proposed and not ratified, or if it was proposed and ratified, and then the text was swapped, or or what the story was behind it. I can't remember it, it entirely, but it seemed to me that. There was an amendment to the Constitution that explicitly prohibited our representatives from holding any office, any political station, recognize, have any fealty to any other country. That that was a specific prohibition. And, and somehow or another, we've, we've managed to walk it around to where that doesn't really mean anything or it wasn't ever implemented in the law or something. But it would have stopped a lot of this shit right up front. Because, like, when they're dealing with China and they're doing this kind of shit with Chinese companies, there is no, there is no recognizable difference between a Chinese company and an entity of the Chinese government. The two are inseparable. One is an expression of the other. You know, the, the, the Chinese government puts all the money and in, in all the education and shit into it, but the, the entity itself reports back to the Chinese government everything. You know, all, all of the, the intellectual property that belongs to the Chinese government. <laughs> and so, you know, if, you, if you're giving them, like, intellectual property, whether that be your email address or the designs for your super secret sp- satellite, spy satellite light or some shit like that. Okay, it, it doesn't matter. It's all property of the Chinese government once they get a hold of it. So any of our any of our uh, federal entities that have this kind of relationship, you know, where they have like their kids are diplomats or or advisors to some Chinese company or something like that and they're getting kickbacks from that from Chinese aid packages that are uh, whatever that they're they're basically owned by the Chinese government <laughs> and and again this this is the whole reason for that prohibition against entangling alliances because it would force our our 
our people, our representatives, to put their interests in those companies, their interests in those countries, the influence of those those connections, that they would have to consider those interests in the decisions they're making in our Congress when they're writing our laws. And that was something our our forefathers did not want because they knew they would just fuck us from the inside by just repapering all the fucking laws and, and fucking it around where the average person didn't know the law of the land. Anyway. Continuing on. I got a whole bunch of other stuff, actually. Um, but this... Uh, these connections and whatnot, that it's one of the things that cryptocurrencies, you know, raw cryptocurrencies that the average person is mining are such a threat to them. Because, it, it, you know, say they're, they're doing all their transactions on one of Accenture's blockchains that they're able to go back and edit at any time. If you don't have a copy of that, you don't know any of the shits that that's going on in the background with them editing balances and editing transactions posts, you know, after they've already happened. You don't know any of that shit. You would know it if it were happening to Bitcoin though, <laughs> because all of a sudden your your Twitter feed would start flashing with all kinds of people going, "Hey, there's something funky going on on the on the blockchain." You know, the, we're getting we're getting weird blocks and and a bunch of transactions that aren't valid formats and <laughs> you know I can't get my my wa- money out of my wallet or into my wallet or you know we would fucking know anyway we've been seeing an increase in this kind of thing but there's one other thing I wanted to get into before we we go on too far to that. And this one is kind of interesting because there there have been multiple battles in Bitcoin about about trying to scale it, or and and I've always said scale your butt. The way that Bitcoin is supposed to scale is that you, yeah, you are supposed to mine it. The more of you that are mining it, the shorter the distances between hops, and the faster we can get the transactions going on the network. But, you know, the, there's all these people back about three or four years ago that were talking shit about how much control the, the miners had. You know what? The miners put forward the work. The miners invest in the hardware. They, do, they, they invest in the hardware. They do the work. They get to make the decisions about what work they do. If you were doing it, and you're perfectly capable of doing it, not necessarily at a profit at this point... If you were to do it, (laughs) you would have control over what, how you mine it. You know, say you don't like the latest version of Bitcoin. Say you don't want to support anything after, after BIP4. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to support BIP7 or 9 or any of that other bullshit. (laughs) That's, that's perfectly within your control to do right now. And it's a, it's a power I think a lot of you just don't take seriously enough. You will, and you will soon. <laughs> soon. But, uh, yeah, you will. Anyway, I've been trying to indicate to people that relying on hash farms is a big mistake. Because the thing is, is they can be pressured. You know, if somebody's hosting 20,000 nodes, and the cops show up to them and say, hey, we want you to support these BIPs, we want you to reject these these format transactions. We want you to you know not not support anybody that's not indicating who they are and doing full AML KYC. And if you don't do it, we are going to arrest you and we are going to take all your hardware. See, that's a major major danger to any cryptocurrency network out there, and it is something that we have not seen enough like thought put into or enough enough awareness put into is that if you're not supporting the networks and you're relying on somebody else to do it and something happens to those fucking networks you know or or one of those big one of those big hash farms goes down gets arrested gets bombed whatever the network's fucked 
You know, and it's going to be a bunch of people just like you scrambling to download the entire blockchain so that you can get going and try and keep the fucking network live. Anyway, got this article here on the Bitcoinist. <laughs> this is pretty interesting. Mimblewimble attacked using $60 per week on AWS. And this is by Osato Avon Namayo. Namayo? Let me check something really quick here. Uh, no indication of genitalia. My apologies. I do not speak Japanese, and that picture does not give us an indication of what you're holding. So I'm just going to say yes, penis, because statistically I'd be right. And uh, this would be uh, this is authored on November eighteenth, two thousand nineteen, at thirteen fifty five. No indication of time zone. Shame on you, Osato. The rundown. Massive mimble wimble flaw uncovered. Still a viable alternative to Zek and XMR. Never was. Continuing on. Ivan Bogaty of Dragonfly Research says he was able to use as little as $60 per week on Amazon Web Services to expose a critical vulnerability on the Mimblewimble privacy architecture. This flaw in the MW protocol may dent the network's aspiration of being a viable alternative to other privacy-focused blockchains like Zcash, Monero, and Verge. Massive Flaw Uncovered in a medium post ugh. sorry Osada we don't give credit to people that are just bagging on let's go back to this guy Dragonfly Research breaking Mimble Wimble's privacy model and this is by Ovin, I, Ivan Bogarty and uh, this is authored November 18th TLDR Mimble Wimble's privacy is fundamentally flawed Using only $60 a week of AWS spend, I was able to uncover the exact addresses of senders and recipients for 96% grin transactions in real time. Oh, dude, that's bad. Might as well not even be using it. The problem is inherent to Memblewimble, and I don't believe there's a way to fix it. This means Memblewimble should no longer be considered a viable alternative to Zcash or Monero when it comes to privacy. In the last two years, Memblewimble has grown in popularity as an up-and-coming lightweight privacy protocol. Memblewimble was invented in 2016 by a pseudonymous hacker known as Tom Elvis Juducer, who dropped a text description of the protocol into an IRC chat, then disappeared. Since then, Memblewimble has most famously implemented, been most famously implemented in the fair-launched privacy coin, Grin. The, VCB, the VC-backed projects Terry and Beam, and is even being considered for integration into Litecoin. <laughs> Several researchers have hypothesized a possible privacy weakness in Mimblewimble. My contribution is to demonstrate the precise way to perform an attack, prove its viability on a live network, and measure its efficacy. In live testing on Grin, I was able to unmask the flow of transactions with a 96% success rate. Therefore, it is now clear that Memblewimble should not be relied on for robust privacy. Here is a more technical deep dive into the attack, complete with open source code to reproduce it, data collected, and a technical fact. What follows in this article will be a high-level intuitive explanation of linkability, how the attack works, and what it means for privacy tech. What is linkability? It's important to understand what this attack means and what it doesn't mean. This attack does not let us determine the amounts that people are getting paid. Mimblewimble successfully obfuscates payment, payment amounts using vanilla elliptic curve cryptography. Patterson commitments, or Patterson, my apologies. What this attack does it let us do is determine who paid who. 
In other words, it let us links it, it lets us link transactions together and determine the flow of payments. It might not be obvious why that's a big deal. Say Coinbase knows that a certain address belongs to a Venezuelan individual named Daniel. You, an American user, try to cash out on Coinbase, but after deobfuscating the transaction graph, Coinbase determines that you received money from David, though they don't know how much you received. Due to OFAC restrictions in, on Venezuela, Coinbase shuts down your account. Naturally, exchanges will know a lot about the transaction graph because they have KYC information on users who cash out into fiat. Or say an author authoritarian government knows that a certain address belongs to a political dissident. You send that dissident a small donation. Later, when you send your Mimblewimble transfer to the local exchange, that exchange shares your transaction data with the government. Since the government can see the entire transaction graph, they now know you supported a political dissident. These attacks would not be possible in Zcash. This is because Zcash is unlinkable, or in other words, every Zcash shielded transaction has a large anonymity set. The anonymity set is essentially the set of transactions that your transaction is indistinguishable from. Think of it like blending into the crowd. The larger the anonymity set, the larger the crowd your transaction is mixed into. In Zcash, each shielded transaction's an anonymity set includes all shielded coins. This is the maximum possible anonymity from an information theoretic perspective. Monero Anonymity Set <clears throat> In Monero, each transaction's anonymity set is the set of all believable decoy transactions. While the Monero client lets you specify the size of the decoy set, the current default is 11. Monero has its own issues around securely sampling decoys, but I believe it mostly works, give or take. It was originally believed that Mimblewimble's anonymity set includes all the transactions in the same block and looks like this. And it's UTXOs from previous blocks, UTXOs spent in this block, new payment. Mimblewimble an anonymity set. But in reality it looks like this. UTXOs from previous blocks, UTXOs sp spent in this block, and then new payment. Or one, one UTX... Uh, through this attack, we can determine the exact address that, that a payment sent. Mimblewimble anonymity set. This whittles down um, Mimblewimble's anonymity set to a single address. To be clear, this is not an indictment of Grin. I have great respect for the Grin community and core developers who have all been tremendously helpful in answering my questions. Grin still affords a, a stronger privacy model than Bitcoin or other, or other non-privacy coins since amounts are safely encrypted, but Mimblewimble provides a strictly weaker privacy model than Zcash or Monero. It makes it insufficient for many real-world privacy use cases. A high-level high overview of the attack. So how exactly can you de-anonymize the transaction graph in Mimblewimble? I noted that despite encrypting the, the payment amounts, Mimblewimble still leaves a linkable transaction graph. But the protocol designers were aware of this, so Mimblewimble uses two chief techniques to combat linkability. The first is full block cut through aggregation. The second is dandelion. The idea behind block cut through is that transactions are accumulated within a block. Those transactions get aggregated into one super transaction. That super transaction basically looks like one giant coin join. Essentially all of the inputs and outputs are tossed into one giant bucket with no easy way to determine who paid who within that bucket. There's a bunch of inputs going in, going to a bunch of outputs with amounts obscured. Sounds solid, right? 
only one problem. This coin join has to be built up one transaction at a time. Because transactions are continually being created and broadcast from separate places, if you run a sniffer node that picks up all the transactions before cut through aggregation is finished, it is trivial to unwind the coin join. Any sniffer node can just observe the network and take note of the original transactions before they get aggregated. It's pretty straightforward if you just archive all messages you observe in the P2P network. Wait, really is that all there is to it? Well, there's another line of defense that the Grin team put up. Dandelion Protocol. Dandelion is a network te networking technique developed by researchers at CMU that attempts to obfuscate the originator of the transaction. Normally, in a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, the originator of a transaction just shouts out their transaction to all of their peers and it quickly cascades through the peer-to-peer -peer network. But in Dandelion Protocol, every transaction broadcast starts with a secret game of telephone. The originator will whisper their transaction to just one peer, who whispers it to an, one other peer, and so on in the chain. After a random number of hops, the final peer will, will shout out the transaction just as in Bitcoin, but this peer is so far removed from the originator, for any observer it's impossible to tell who the chain started with. This works great for obfuscating the IP of the transactor, but Dandelion has a, section, a second function within Grin. It just so happens to defeat sniffer archive nodes. Because every transaction, <clears throat> because every transaction starts off on, in a Dandelion chain, whenever two transactions cross in their Dandelion chains, they'll get aggregated early. If this happens, then by the time the transaction is broadcast for everyone to observe, the sniffer node cannot dis disaggregate them. They've, they've already been coin joined. Against a sniffer node, this is Grin's principal defense against linkability, but even this defense can be defeated. By default, each Grin node connects to, two, uh, to eight other peers. By jacking up the number of peers, I can connect my sniffer node to every other node in the network. Assuming I stay alive long enough, eventually almost every, every node will connect to me, making me a super node. Once I am a super node, there's a high probability that I will be on the, on the dandelion path for any transaction. Therefore, the only way that I cannot catch transa a transaction before it's aggregated is if two transactions both intersect in their dandelion path before I see either of them. If I see either transaction before they're aggregated, I can use simple set sub subtraction to disaggregate them. In my attack, I was able to link 96% of, of all transactions while only connecting to 200 peers out of, a total, out of the total 3,000 peers in Grin's network. But if I wanted to spend a little bit more money, I could easily connect to 3,000 nodes to disaggregate almost all transactions. I also don't have to do this as a single super node. The same attack works by, by launching 3,000 separate nodes with unique IPs, each only connected to one peer. As long as I'm sniffing all the transaction data and dumping it into a central master database, the attack works just the same. So is Mimblewimble salvageable? It depends. I believe that Grin, as currently envisaged, has no clear path to unlinkability. Simply ratcheting up the dandelion factor can easily can can be easily combated by a motivated attacker, as I discussed in this technical write-up. But linkability aside, Mimblewimble still has unique and valuable properties. 
It allows cut-through aggregation, which is an, an effective compaction technique for full nodes, and effectively hide trans, uh, hides transaction amounts. If you want strong privacy, you can always combine Mimblewimble with another protocol that obscures the transaction graph, such as in Ethereum 9, 9 and 3 quarters, which combines Mimblewimble with, with a zero-cash style commitment nullifier scheme. But, it's clear that Mimblewimble on its own is not strong enough to confer robust privacy. Bitcoin is now 11 years old, but cryptocurrencies are still in their infancy. It wasn't that long ago that devastating bugs were uncovered in both Zcash and Monero. This is to be expected. Most of the interesting technologies are still in the realm of basic science. But, this is how science always advances. We propose new theories, and then we repeatedly knock them down until what's left standing has stood the test of time. Thanks to Hasib Qureshi for major help in putting together this write-up and for the anonymity set illustrations. Additional thanks to Oleg Ostro Ostromov, um, Elena Natalinsky, Mohamed Fouda, my apologies, sir, Lucas Ryan, and Nader Al Naji for reviewing drafts of this post. And a huge thanks to Jake Stoltzman, uh, Near Protocol, for the dandelion and block aggregation illustrations. For more of my writing, blah, 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 we're not going to go on that anymore. But let's see what the comments are on this, or if there are any. Oh, there's six responses. Hmm. Um, Binary Fate says, Nice work to explore this attack, and especially to explain it so well. Some corrections on where your article is wrong or could use better references. You say a while Monero client lets you s specify the size of the decoy set. The current default set is 11, but actually it is, it is actually mandatory to be 11. Um, let's see, no more wallet options. This has been enforced since more than a year. Um, your link for devastating bug discovered in Mero links to a paper uh, links to a paper that is not about a devastating bug by any standard. It only explores things written down already in 2014 by the Monero Research Lab. Um, read this response for more details. Um, I would advise to rather link to the inflation bug discovered in Monero. This one clearly devastating. Blah blah blah. Okay, yeah. <sighs> Uh, let's see, Mably says, Do you realize that you have discovered absolutely nothing and that you didn't break anything as those Mimblewimble limitations are known from the beginning? <laughs> yeah, it could be. And uh, the professor says, Unlike all, all other networks and projects listed, Zcash is not even relevant to decentralized technology as it depends entirely on trust in a central party due to its flawed algorithm choice requirement for a central selection of participants in a trusted setup. All other developers of the, pro of the other projects are aware of the algorithm and avoid it for technical and ethical reasons as they do value decentralization and trust minimization that simply doesn't exist in Zcash. Comparing Zcash to decentralized cryptocurrencies is misleading and suggests there are no downsides while the downside dwarfs any benefits gained by better privacy and renders the entire network irrelevant. Um, you know, that's that's a point that you got to make. You know, that not everybody's going to support it. Let's see. Um, uh, Mark Andrew Skate's response to binary fate to quibble with your differing definition of an attack is asinine and does nothing but, ex but except put your face in someone else's work again. <clears throat> break your own code and write about it, then you can link up whatever you wish to. The man just did something no one else thought of could do for the past two years, yet you're going to correct him on his thoughts and a link. It's said I put this comment knowing knowing much like YouTube, the comment section is where you trolls hang out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
Gary uses looks nothing looks like nothing new here except the attention grabbing title, but that's not true. Oh, let's see here. Hmm. There's another article about this. You know, one of these days I'm just gonna run this shit and find out. Let's see here. Come on, show me the fucking article. Ah, right, here we go. And this is by um, Daniel Lenberg, and it was authored on November 18th. Uh, factual inaccuracies of breaking Mimblewimble's privacy model. And we're not going to read the TLDR or whatever. The article, Breaking Mimblewimble's Privacy Model, has been making the rounds today, in which the author asserts that they somehow have broken Mimblewimble and Grin's privacy model. The attack that the author claims to have made is the well-documented and discussed transaction graph input-output linkability problem. This is not new to anyone on the Grin team or anyone who has studied the Mimblewimble protocol. Grin acknowledged the ability to link outputs on their on chain in a privacy primer published on its public wiki in, on November 18th. Or, I'm sorry, on in November 2018, before the main net was launched. The problem encompasses Ian Mears, or Myers rather, flashlight attack, which we have listed as one of our open research problems. Numerous claims, including the title of the article itself, are factually inaccurate. On a high level, the article reads as a not-so-subtle takedown piece that claims an attention-grabbing result. The conclusion of the article, however, contains many logical leaps that are not substantiated via the network analysis exercise that is described. The Grin team has consistently acknowledged that Grin's privacy is far from perfect. While transaction linkability is a limitation that we're looking to mitigate as part of our goal of ever-improving privacy, it does not break Mimblewimble, nor is it anywhere close to being so fundamental as to render it or Grin's privacy features useless. Rather than provide a point-by-point refutation of this article, we would like to point out the major issues we have with the research and its con- and its conclusions. Number one, Mimble, Mimblewimble does not have addresses. The most fundamental privacy benefit of Mimblewimble is unfortunately the most fundamental issue with the research and related article. Mimblewimble doesn't have addresses such as those that might be linked to a particular Bitcoin wallet. Value is exchanged by participants, adding one-time outputs to a transaction, and at no point is anything resembling an identifying address presented to the network or the chain data. Number two, it's not possible to link addresses that do not exist. The researcher appears to take an inconsistent approach to this point. The GitHub repository accompanying this article states, quote, There are no addresses, only UTXOs hidden as Pedersen commitments. Subsequently, the following scenarios are painted. Quote, Say I'm, a law, I'm law enforcement and I know that an address belongs to a, a vendor on the darknet market. When you send your green coins to Coinbase, Coinbase links your address to, with that name. The Medium art- article continues, or say that an authoritarian government knows that a certain address belongs to a political dissident. You can send that dissident. You can send that dissident a small donation, or you send that small. You send that dissident a small tra- donation. It's unclear how law enforcement would know anything about a non-existent address, or how Coinbase could link an address that does not exist to a name or, for that matter, how an authoritarian government would be able to link a non-address to a political dissident. We have to assume that the author conveniently confused transaction outputs, TXOs, with addresses, but these are not the same, and, as we've already detailed, the fact that TXOs can be linked is hardly news. 
The number 95.5% is close to 100%. It also doesn't mean much. The details about the actual exercise carried out is described as an attack. So-called sniffer nodes collect transactions that are broadcast from nodes as part of the stem and puff phase of dandelion. The author is able to collect 95.5% of transactions on the network in a particular time period. <clears throat> Other than, quote, output A spends output B, or spends to output B, it's less clear what exactly is being identified here or what else the author is able to accomplish with this information. Number four. The transaction graph alone does not reveal information about the transacting parties. While it would be desirable to avoid linking the transaction graph, the graph alone doesn't necessarily reveal the sender and receiver outputs. Without amounts, it's difficult to distinguish between change in outputs and recipient outputs. Even if the article doesn't attempt to actually do this, it would be an interesting area for future research. Number five, and the author doesn't seem to be aware of this. The GitHub repository reads, quote, What we uncover is the transaction graph, the record of who paid whom. But that's not how this works. Let's take a concrete example. Alice builds a transaction with Bob, perhaps via Tor, via Grimbox, or via Direct File Exchange. Then, she broadcasts this transaction to the network via a hosted node, for example using Wallet713. In this example, a sniffer node monitoring the network would not uncover any information about Alice, and certainly not a record of who paid whom. The flashlight attack is an active attack where an adversary is participating in the transaction building process. The network analysis exercise in this, in this article is passive and would not be enough. Number 6. The headline is misleading. Nothing is being broken here. The title of the article is Breaking Mimblewimble's Privacy Model. Obscuring transaction outputs from being linked by monitoring nodes is not something that's covered by Mimblewimble's privacy model. The, amb the ambition here is to get there, but we're not there yet, and there have been no claims otherwise. In conclusion, you never achieve greater privacy than the size of your anonymity set. Grin is a minimal cryptocurrency that aims to be privacy-preserving, scalable, and fair. It is far from perfect, but it achieves an equivalent security model as Bitcoin with better privacy that, that comes enabled by default with less data required to, keep on chain, to be kept on chain. It does all this without a trusted setup, without a development tax, ICO, or pre-mine. Yet, Grin is still very young and has yet to reach its full potential. Eleven months into mainnet, there is low network usage. In the last 1,000 blocks, 22% contained only a single transaction, and 30% contained no transactions, meaning their inputs and outputs are trivially, are trivially, trivial, trivially linkable. This won't change until there's greater network usage, but it still does not imply that sender and receiver identities are revealed. Privacy research is helped by collaboration. As Grin contributors, we're glad to see that there's interest taken in the project. Scientific analysis and scrutinizing of Grin's protocol and Coinbase, or quote, code base rather, is something that we welcome in the community but also expect to carry some degree of rigor. In fact, it's something we might have even been able to help with had we been asked to. The author of the paper, Haseeb Oleg, Elena Mohammed, and Nader reviewed their, their work, yet unfortunately did not take the opportunity to let anyone in the Green, green community 
do the same and offer friendly feedback on what they were about to publish. Doing so might have prevented this response and could have improved the quality of the work. In a tweet, the author of the article writes, quote, Importantly, I have great respect for the green community and core developers, who have all been tremendously helpful in answering my questions. It almost sounds as though they've approached us here in with the article, yet none of us have any recollection of encountering the author or this work in our Gitter channel or in Keybase. This was a missed opportunity to produce better quality research. I have to agree, if you are going to do any kind of research on a coin, it is best to, to look to yourself first, but if you do have any questions, it's even better to start asking people that are actually involved in designing the project. I'm, I mean, and, and again, there, there could be some, some confusion here, but Ivan Bogarty actually, uh, actually responded on this. Let's, let's check what he says. Uh, number one, there is some debate on whether an attack is new academically. As I note in the post and tweet storm, the attack has been independently hypothesized by other researchers, Grim, develop Grim developers and myself, a while ago. Okay. The novelty is in the, in the live demonstration and precise experimental results. Further, it definitely seems to be news to a lot of people who are not in the trenches, trenches reading Grin code. Great summaries on this from from um, Balaji and UD. My research claims to break the privacy model, the assumptions of user, user privacy, and does just that. Breaking the protocol itself would indeed be a different thing. Number three. There's some confusion because, quote, Grin doesn't have addresses, only commitments. <clears throat> In practice, commitments are isomorphic to Bitcoin with no address for use. But, or I'm sorry, if Bitcoin is to keep the flow of transactions private, it is not, why build anything else? With this attack, the Grin Block Explorer could be built that allows following commitments in exactly the same way Bitcoin UTXOs can be formed on-chain now. Number four, right now, if Alice purchases Grin on an exchange and later uses it to shop on a darknet mar market, a sniffer node will capture a precise, undeniable trail of commitments, starting with the KYC exchange commitment and ending on the darknet market that incriminates Alice. Alice would not expect that because she thinks Grin is private and further, public block explorers can't show that link. Only these special sniffer nodes can. This is the key point. Other Grin developers 1 and 2 have taken this work for what it is a hands-on empirical confirmation that exposes an important research problem. It needs to be known by potential users and fixed for Grin to get wide adoption as a privacy-preserving cryptocurrency. And I guess there's a response on this. Uh, let's see here. Get it. Blah, blah, blah. We got that. Let's see responses. Apparently there's a response. And David Burkett says, Here's our privacy model that, that hasn't changed in over a year. Please note that inputs and outputs. Linking is unchecked, meaning we don't claim to provide TX on linkability. You've provided ex excellent empirical evidence for why we were correct not to claim to offer TX on linkability, but you have not broken the privacy model. Um... I don't know. I I haven't examined the code, and honestly, I probably wouldn't know what to look for <laughs> um, in uh, trying to prove whether or not they did break the privacy model. Um, but I think the corrections there do kind of winnow away a little bit of the misunderstanding, and um, I don't know. I'd be concerned. Um, but it's something that. If you're that concerned about it, do check with the people actually working on the development. If you have a specific question or something, apparently they're very, very 
like on it with regard to media concerning their project. So I I would imagine that you could like tweet them or maybe message them on Facebook or something like that. Get a hold of one of them, talk to them. You know this. It's one thing about cryptocurrencies that I think people do take for granted is that, you know, because you're seeing articles written about them and whatnot, these aren't, uh, for the most part, these are not huge companies that, you know, have major, major set policies and whatnot, and they don't take any input from the public or anything like that. That's not the case. They're people just like you that are working on these things. And so if you're observing something that, you know, you think is of concern, talk to them about it they'd be more than willing to hear you out probably even ask you to help them if you're if you're knowledgeable enough and so yeah a lot of back and forth there let's go ahead and throw back down into some music and as far as where we're going to go with that we haven't been playing very much today We've been a lot of a lot of talk um i think we need some some megadeth hook and mouth here on Coin Metal. And that was sixth with Hold My Finger. Anywho, speaking of fingers and where to put them, I had this whole thing planned out and we kind of went off on a on a jaunt there with that <clears throat> with that Mimble Wimble business, but we got enough time that I think I can cover this other aspect of where I wanted to go today. And uh, this one's on Pornhub.com, and this is a notice to people who create art to upload to Pornhub. Urgent PayPal payments or payouts no longer supported. We are devastated. Oh, and uh, this is authored <coughs> five days ago, and this is by Brett. So yes, penis. We are all devastated by PayPal's decision to stop payouts to over 100,000 performers who rely on them for their livelihoods. If you have PayPal as your payout option, please select a new method and update your information in your Model Settings tab. If you have a pending payout for October and were using PayPal, please contact us immediately, send support type, payment issues with your updated payment method and update your payment info in your model settings tab as well. Payments will start to be sent out the end of the the end of this week. We sincerely apologize if this causes any delays and we will have staff working around the clock to make sure all payouts are processed as fast as possible on the new payment method the, the new payment methods. New for European models, read how to get direct debit here. For Canadian models, direct deposit there. For U.S. models, read direct deposit. And they do have, among the options, we we did, um, I did follow this up, as a matter of fact. I um, mean, uh, what type of payment method is offered? Our current available payment methods are Paxim, Check, Verge Cryptocurrency, and Direct po- Deposit. Um Verge cryptocurrency is pretty much a direct deposit too, except it's direct deposit in a different crypto in a different currency than your standard. Direct deposit is currently available for U.S. and Canadian models. Only European models now have SEPA direct deposit options too. Paxim is a type of e-wallet. You must have a valid Paxim account in order to receive payments. Paxim is is processed more quickly than checks, but are subject to withdrawal fees. <clears throat> checks are discreet and have no mention of Pornhub or adult entertainment. They do take longer to receive and cannot be tracked. To accept Verge cryptocurrency, you'll need a Verge wallet, which you can get here. Verge, Verge, uh, curren- vergecurrency.com slash wallets. To update your payment method, just visit the model settings section of your profile and choose your preferred method. Your payment information must be correct within the first three. 
three business days of the month or else payments will be delayed. <clears throat> and we're going to leave it at that. Bad decision. Bad decision, PayPal. You know, trying to fuck with people's money at this point or another is just... It's kind of setting you up for setting yourself up for suicide. You know, basically that's that's what you're doing is you're making a value decision that you don't necessarily have to make, but you're doing it for your own ideological reasons, and that's that's you're free to do that. But you're not operating in an environment where your option is the only option or even the most desirable option. For a wide number of reasons, this being one of them. <clears throat> Pardon me, I had to get a little water there. <clears throat> but yeah, in, in a um, in a monetary paradigm where the only transfer medium is the U.S. dollar or Federal Reserve note, as I call it, because that's what it really is. Um, when it is in one, and it's denominated solely within that unit. You have a bit more control over how people receive their money. You know, at any point, Paxim, they could say, you know what, we're not gonna, we're we're not gonna take any more porn, porn Pornhub payments. We're we're just gonna we're just gonna bounce those. We're gonna close everybody's accounts, and we're not gonna take their business anymore. They can do that. They're just like PayPal in that aspect. Of course, checks. That's that's something that. Could be could be enforced by the bank that issued the check. You know, the, there's two issuers involved there. There's the the bank that issues the check, and then there's the customer that signs off on a certain amount being forwarded to you. Now, how you would how you would deposit it? That's that's up to you. There's and there there are methods on that. And and just just to give you an idea, the loosest easiest way to go about that is go down to like Walmart or 7-Eleven and get one of those prepaid Visa cards. You know, and you put five bucks on it just to, you know, keep it alive or whatever. And, you know, you receive your cash payments to that or your, or your, uh, you know, if they'll do direct deposit, which according to this, they will, um, or your checks. You know, when you when you um, go to like a, a standard ATM, I think there's there's some that are affiliated with Green Dot, which is the underlying bank. And uh, you just go down to like Walmart, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure their their ATMs there will let you deposit checks straight to your card, as well as cash. But yeah, that's uh, that's the world we're living in, where these intermediaries can interfere with your money and when they do though again we are not in a paradigm where they are the only option you could just as easily be accepting your payments via verge currency and then on your bitrex account you take your verge currency to your bitrex account you deposit the verge on your on your bitrex account for a very very minimal fee and i think that'd just be the transaction fee on the on the verge network but you, you get the the money deposited on the account, the exchange account, and you, you fucking you, you could sell it or you could invest it or you know whatever. And I think that's that's a bit of control that we've never had available to us. Like okay, so say you receive the money in the form of U.S. dollars in a check to your Green Dot account, and then you deposit those funds on on Bittrex or another cryptocurrency exchange that allows you to hold a, uh, a altcoin. You know, say Bitcoin isn't doing as well as you'd like it to, and maybe the U.S. dollar is experiencing a lot of inflation, and you want to put the money somewhere where it might actually appreciate in the time that you're not utilizing it. That's, that's an option that's available to you now. That, that used to be your fucking checking account. You used to put the money in your checking account and accrue 5% interest on it. I mean, I, I had a period of time when I had my environment pretty much wired. You know, like, I was working three jobs, one of those on the weekend, and basically it consisted to a trip to the lake where I helped people weigh their fish, 
and, and then go home and with with a check in my hand. Now, of course, I reported taxes on all of it. That's that's beside the point, you know. But I had two hourly jobs, so I eliminated the cost of having to have a gym or having a gym membership by just working at a gym. And then I worked at a a tackle store where I got all of my tackle cheap. And as a matter of fact, because the manufacturers wanted us to sell their stuff, they would give us stuff. You know, there'd be like little incentives, you know, sell three of these, get one of these, you know, something like that. And so I was getting gear just like falling out my ass there. And then I worked it out with somebody, uh, the, the guy running the bait receiver, that if I hooked him up, with products that either discount or just simply gratis that he would hook me up with bait pretty much whenever I wanted it and he would just have to make a request and I would fulfill the request and and then I would get free bait and this worked out really fucking good there was a period of time when in the in the harbor there was there was squid available but the only people that got the squid were the sport boats and me <laughs> because I had worked this out you know and so like I said I I didn't really have any need to spend the money that I was earning when I was working at the gym and the tackle store because I was riding my bike too so I wasn't paying auto insurance I wasn't paying gas any of that other bullshit and so I'd managed to accrue a half decent amount of money in my bank account and it in itself was accruing interest sitting there now, if I was a little more sophisticated at the time, I probably would have been trading. You know, I probably would have, you know, figured out a way to get a license for it and, and been trading. But at this point, although I do suck at trading, I, you know, I managed to put a meal or two in my mouth doing it. So, you know, it's a, it's something that is available to me now and, and has been available to me for shit since 2014 2015 uh that that wasn't available ever before i i can only imagine how it would have been if i'd had that if i'd established those same relationships and i had cryptocurrencies as a means of accepting and distributing payment I mean, I, I'd have probably, probably been a rich fat cat, man, doing doing f- real tune-up jobs and stuff like that and, and receiving all my funds via cryptocurrency. I'd probably be a very fat cat living in Los Angeles County by now. You know, and I'm... But, you know, of course, I have other, other obligations, you know? Not all riches are monetary. <laughs> we'll just say that. But in any case, the, the point being that if you are using a third-party intermediary to facilitate your payments, your your digital payments at any time, they can change their minds. They can change their policies. They can have somebody else change their policies for them, i.e. government, via regulation. And so, rather than assuming those risks, you have the option of participating in a cryptocurrency network relatively cheaply, and be earning money for doing it, but also being able to transact your monetary value directly onto that network via your node. You know that's that's what the that's why you mine. You know it's part of the benefit of mining. Is you you have direct fidelity. You, you know what's going on on the fucking network. You know the status of your funds. You can verify the status of your funds at any time, anywhere. You don't even have to be at your computer or even be, you know, holding your funds or considering selling your funds. You don't have to be looking at your wallet. You just have to have the address or the identifier for the transactions. That is, you know, it's it's something that would potentially be exclusive to you that only you would know or you and the network, of course. But the point being is that a minimum number of of participants is involved or can be involved. You can just disintermediate all that risk and all that bullshit. And like I said, you know that but the the minor cost you got to pay 
is actual participation in the mining of the cryptocurrency in question. And, you know, I, I don't think that's a very big cost, considering what you get in return. Anyway, I've got a couple other notable examples of this interference. And this one is on uh, newslogical.com. It's by Solomon Odayan. Odoneo, Odoneo, my apologies, sir. Uh, but yes, penis. Bitcoin's free will. Tron's Justin Sun says Bank of America terminated his eight years account. Lovely. The unusual action of the Bank of America was first hinted by entrepreneur Rol Roloff, Roloff Botha and later corroborated by Tron founder and CEO Justin Sun. Roloff, Ro, Roloff Botha shared a letter dispatched to him by the Bank of America and the proposed permanent restriction of his 20 years of relationship with the bank based on no highlighted reason while Justin Sun jokingly shared the termination of his 8 years old account with the bank. Could this give room to a better explanation of the free will offered by Bitcoin and other decentralized digital currencies? Bank of America fires Roloff Botha. After 20 years of banking relationship, Roloff Bo Botha was reportedly fired by the Bank of America. According to him, no genuine cause of action ha was stated. Rolev shared the letter dispatched by the Carolina-based American Multinational Investment Bank. In the letter, he was informed that his account will be permanently closed 30 days from the day of the notice. Captioning the letter, Rolev said, After being a customer of Bank America for 20 years, I received this notice today that they des decided to fire me as their customer, with no explanation. <laughs> Justin Sun shares a similar experience. The founder and CEO of Tron, Justin Sun, in a tweet that looks like meme corroborated role of both his recent incident with the Bank of America. Reacting to the captioned letter and Roloff's, Roloff's grief, the Tron CEO said he he's also a victim of such action from the same bank. He said, Me too. I have been a customer of the Bank of America for eight years and got fired as well. Free will Bitcoin initiates. Bitcoin, the largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization, launched a decentralized financial monetary system, a system that gives its believers free will to transform their stored capitals into an asset and totally out of the control of third-party governments and central banks. After Bitcoin initiated this free will monetary system through the intelligence of its anonymous creator Satoshi Nakamoto, Tons of other decentralized digital currencies flocked the cryptocurrency market. Obviously, their existence have challenged, and it is still challenging, the aged fiat monetary system that is majorly influenced by the government. <clears throat> Bitcoin is powered by a technology which... Or, now, it's powered by participation of, of the peers... Uh, which seem not to be understood by the government, giving it the power to serve and function based on operational free will. The coin has been successfully hard forked into several forms of cryptocurrencies, such as Litecoin and others, and these forms are thriving in line with the legacy set by the king of coins, Bitcoin. The fact that the institutional investors now show their interest in the decentralized form of money has added to the advantage and future prospect of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in the market. The Centralized Monetary System Effect The centralized monetary system is totally under the watch and control of government, backed by lots of seemingly unfavorable terms and conditions. Indeed, people clamor for a new and fair monetary system 
that would offer them a bit more control over their stored capitals and assets. This is where the functionality of the decentralized Bitcoin and possibly other cryptocurrencies comes into play. Goddamn right, Solomon. Goddamn right. And that, that choice, I think, is going to be a much more powerful ex expression of our will than it has been for probably centuries. You know, this, this agency over our uh, over our monetary value it's it, it's been denied us by having all of it stored in one one unit or the fiat currencies of our nations you know and it, unfortunately it, the value of of such is intrinsically related to the monetary policies and spending policies of the government in question and, and this puts a hell of a lot of interest against bit against currencies that you know it's like there's things that they're being used for and the the issuers and and like primary utilizers of that currency are doing with it that you might not necessarily agree with you might look at those policies and say you know what i don't approve of that I am not going to circulate the IOUs of this in, this entity as my expression of where where I want my monetary value to be stored. And we're now having the option to just say no. I I, I want to keep it in Monero. I want to keep it in Litecoin. I want to keep it in Bitcoin. I want to keep it in Tron. And this fundamentally changes the relationship between consumers and government and banks. You are now a sovereign. Use that power very, very carefully. Because when you, when you do use a currency, you are expressing an approval of what it is used for. And when you look at the news, do you, do you really approve of the way your government spends money? If not, why would you want to continue to fund it? Maybe, maybe give them a taste tester of what poverty looks like. You, you, pro you probably see it every day. <laughs> and, and, you know, they, they might change their tune about how they spend the money. But again, it's, it's this denial of agency that's allowed these, these abuses to happen. You know, there's a lack of discipline there, there, without any negative feedback because it's denied you the option to convey negative feedback because you can't disapprove of, of the ways that, you're, that the issuers of your monetary value use their, their power of issuance and investment and disbursement. You don't have a way to effectively tell those people, no, I don't, I don't want to support you. You know, I, I don't want to participate in this. But I believe, personally, I believe that in the not so distant future, people are going to exercise this will a hell of a lot more than they do now. That people will be dedicating electricity, bandwidth, and monetary value into hardware. To the purpose of mining publicly mined cryptocurrencies and they will be doing so out of self-interest and their values will shape which coins they support that's my belief you know but first thing i i think that we're going to see increasing pressure put on bigging bigger mining operations like if you're if you're hosting like 500 nodes or something like that uh, they're they're probably going to put the thumb on you and put the arm on you and say, hey, um, we need you to support this BIP. We need you to reject these transactions. We need you to blacklist these addresses, so on and so forth. And they will either acquiesce or they will sell their hardware. <clears throat> and I think the drop-offs that we see in the, in the network hash rates will say to the, the rest of us, hey, you know what? The difficulty is going down. 
that hardware that's been deprecating in your closet now has some some potential to be creating monetary value for you <laughs> so you know you might want to bust it out and plug it in you know and we will see a diffusion of the hash rate it's not going to be coming from big ass hash farms anymore it's going to be coming from itty bitty nodes scattered all over the fucking planet just like it it was before a6 showed up only there will be a6 sparsed in there but they ain't going to be no 500 5000 units they're going to be 5 units going to be 10 units but you're going to be mining profitably with those because there there won't be any nobody will be able to concentrate enough hashing power in any one individual area without risk of drawing the ire of their government you know i think it's going to start with these big ass hash farms and i think it's going to work its way down government still doesn't know how to handle it and, and honestly i don't think that we're going to that <clears throat> that path where everybody's reporting what they've mined and are paying income tax on coins that they mined that they themselves mined i think they might they might draw a bigger exception to that than just accepting the income tax on their on their paycheck that they receive from their employer because you have the option and I, I think that option being as powerful as it is will be utilized a hell of a lot more than anybody wants it to you know I've I've had several talks with people and, and for the last couple of years now it seems like those that are familiar with um, Nelson Mandela seem to think that we're on to the then they then you win phase motherfucker we, we aren't even through the then they laugh at you phase right now they're still laughing at us right now they are still laughing at us but in the not so distant future i believe their current monetary policies extended for another year or two are going to have drastic effects on the retail price of items every item starting with oil starting with shit that everybody needs commodities like uh, silver gold food that we'll start seeing that fiat inflation created by all of that money printing that's been going on this last year or two years I don't, I don't know how long it's been going on but it's been going on for a while and the only reason we aren't seeing it translating into an, a price increase for bitcoin and all we're really seeing is a price boy of it you know it's boying up the price is because of the existence and utilization of stable coins see i believe that none of them actually have the monetary value that they claim that they do they don't have the billions of dollars that they say are backing their coins they just have complicit exchanges exchanges that are willing to honor coins they know aren't worth one dollar as one dollar on their exchange and that that in my mind makes them slightly criminal but I, in fact i believe that stable coins themselves are issued by central banks or are are the product of central banks i mean with with usdc i i can say that conclusively why the line of custody goes usdc okay they're they're issued by circle circle is owned by goldman sachs there you have it goldman sachs is printing counterfeit fiat in the form of usdc i would be willing to bet that whatever they're counting as collateral is probably customers money from some other thing you know that they it's it's an asset that they have on their balance sheet that they know that is going to be there for you know 10 20 years or whatever maybe maybe some gold holdings or gold certificates and they know they're not going to get cashed out anytime soon so they're using them as collateral for you know for for usdc's <clears throat> and maybe not even that or or at least they're counting it as collateral whether or not they'll ever liquidate it to to make their customers whole or not is a question is another question entirely but I, I think that um, if there were a point 
where the next financial crisis will happen, I think it will be in the stablecoin market. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's that's the the point that doesn't have the kind of accountability that cryptocurrencies do. When you mine a cryptocurrency, what you receive as the payout for the the effort that you're putting forward, if you you know you get the block, you get the block reward. <clears throat> You get it in the currency that's transacted on that ex- on that network. I was going to say exchange, but that's not it. But you're getting the native coin for that network. That means you have an entirely closed loop cycle between money issuer and bank within one that you don't necessarily have to exit out of in order to transact with others. And you can even be using the the size and participation of the network to decide who you're going to do business with. This is is an incredible power that hasn't been lent to us for a very, very long time. And now it's here. And and, uh, honestly, I uh, I don't think we're any closer as a society as a whole um, to understand the full depth of the power that has been handed over to the everyman we may yet live to see it though and it is with that that i like to close out this episode thank you very much for listening i certainly do appreciate the support we will be back again on uh, i was going to say wednesday but i i might actually have something going on on wednesday and it's it's kind of up in the air as to whether or not i'll actually be able to make it to the show um but i will notify you as I can on both uh, Yen.io and uh, Facebook. I'm, I'm kicked off at of Twitter. Otherwise, I, I'd announce it there. Anyway, it, uh, yeah, like that. We're going to close out this episode. In, uh, so until Friday, I guess. Uh, that's all I'm going to commit to at the moment. Friday, trade safe. Do your homework. And watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. And as far as our last dance is concerned, oh, let's see here. We've got about four minutes left. Hmm. Uh, that leaves a lot of options open. A lot of options open indeed. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, maybe. Here we go. Abominator. Last dance here on Coin Metal. Thank you again for listening. Y'all have an excellent evening. Good night. <laughs>